Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Prerna Singh Bindra. I'm a wildlife conservationist and writer. And I'm delighted to be here today to talk with Dr. M.K. Ranjit Singh, who's a living legend in the uh, wildlife conservation in India and indeed globally. It is a task impossible to speak of his achievements in the little time that I've been allotted. But uh, let me try. Uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1961. And in his sheer years, he served as a collector of Mandla, which is next to Kana National Park, which I will come to later in our conversation. He was also the, uh, later on in his uh, career, he was the Secretary of Tourism and uh, uh, wild, uh, Environment and Forests in Madhya Pradesh. In whose tenure, in that tenure, he established 14 new sanctuaries, eight new national parks, and doubled the area of three existing national parks, which is a huge achievement. And he also served as the country's first director of wildlife preservation under the Environment Ministry. Uh, that's, uh, that was twice in his uh, lifetime. He, one of his key contributions has been uh, drafting and piloting the Wildlife Protection Act uh, in India, the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, which is one of the strongest such legislations in the world um, and for which we are truly grateful to him. Uh, I have been very fortunate to serve with Sir uh, on India's National Board for Wildlife as a term and he's personally been a guiding light, uh, uh, an inspiration. He set the bar high for all of us and uh, it's such a pleasure, Sir, to welcome you here. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ranjit, for your time. I would Thank like you to very much, Sir. You know, my pleasure, sir. Um, I'll come back to your early career later, but let me start that when I first approached Dr. Ranjit Singh for, for giving us a time for this interview, he said post-lunch. And when I asked him why, he says that because all night he's sitting to write his book. Um, uh, so his nights are devoted to writing his new book on the, and I hope uh, this is for public consumption, on the mountain mammals of, uh, of the world. Uh, the work we are looking forward to, sir. And here I would like to bring in the fact that, you know, sir's contribution to uh, also to the conservation of hoofed animals, which I think have a special place in your heart. As Mandla collector, you helped save the Barasinga from extinction. Then later on, the Sangai, you played a role in its protection. You have been, uh, you have taken the Hangul uh, case of the Hangul in uh, Srinagar, its protection to, you have been, uh, very uh, instrumental in that, as well as your love for the mountains. So can you tell us, take us back and tell us how, you know, we, we all know your love for the tiger, but mountains and hoofed animals, um, if you can, and your PhD is on black bucks. So if you can us, you know, how. I don't have any certain um, uh, sort of confined uh, interest in, uh, in, um, in uh, hoofed animals. Uh, just that there are more hooved animals than there are uh, animals uh, uh, than there are felids and canids. Um, and my youngest uh, memories, uh, childhood memories, are associated with uh, hooved animals as much as leopards. Um, I grew up with leopards in the backyard, as it were. But um, coming back to your question, um, I love the mountains. Um, the scenery, the challenge, the backdrop. I have never been a mountaineer. I've never climbed a mountain for the sake of climbing. But I have climbed mountains to look at animals because these animals are gorgeous. They are extremely um, uh, attractive, very impressive, a markhor or an ibex or a wild sheep. But the challenge of getting there, close to them in that open terrain, Firstly, there is the altitude, and in the Himalayas, uh, 16,000 is commonplace, and you're out of breath. And uh, I, my first exposure was in Ladakh in 1958, when I was 20 years old, and, and um, I was a college student, and we had to walk, because there was no way. So we walked for over a month. Uh, I got cust um, acclimatized, and after that, uh, I've been going to Ladakh and it's been a very special place. The thing is, 
that as far as biodiversity is concerned, there is no place in the world, mountain biodiversity, as the Himalayas. The flora and the avifauna we know. But I focus more upon the fauna. And of all the mountain species that uh, you mentioned uh, about writing, incidentally, nobody has written on the mountain mammals of the world. So when I broached the subject to George Schaller, who's an iconic person, I've known him since uh, uh, 64, um, he was very enthusiastic. And he said, uh, you probably are more qualified to write than anybody else because I've seen most of those species. I've gone around looking. And in that process of going to different uh, habitats, you see the world. And you see a very diverse uh, uh, spectrum of wildlife and the backdrop, which is very interesting. So uh, I started on that. And uh, I haven't studied all of them in depth, but I have watched them for hours, some more than the others, and uh, practically seen all of, almost all of them. And I have photographs, and there are friends who are going to help me out with those photographs uh, of animals, which I may not have seen. And there are a, a, a few. But coming back to the Himalayas, um, the, I give this example over and over again. The longest mountain chain in the world is uh, the Andes of South America. 23,000 running uh, kilometers. 23,000. Oh my God. The Himalayas, amongst the great mountain ridges, the highest, but it's the shortest amongst the great ones, mm -hmm. only 6,000 kilometers. But it mm -hmm. blocks the Trans Himalaya from the Himalayas. So you have the advantage of both, the fauna. Mm -hmm. And of course, the topography is totally different once you cross the main ranges. And it's fascinating. But <clears throat> the Himalayas have more than half the mountain, mountain species of the world. The oh state God. of Jammu That's... and Kashmir almost had half of the whole world. Oh. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. The, the yeah. Andes. That's... Yes. And I regard it as one state still. <laughs> what, what, what was signed by Maharaj Hari Singh Ji to the Union of India in 1940. That if you take that, it is more than half of the entire mountain mammals of the world. They are larger ones. The entire, that's, that's... Uh, the entire range, as I said, the longest, Andes, has oh. four, species, four species. Only four true mountain mammals. I'm writing on them. I haven't seen of one or two, but I've seen the others. I have seen mm -hmm. six in one day in the Changchenmo district, Changchenmo area, hot springs, of Ladakh, walking and riding on a horse, 14 day, 14 hours, six. That is more than South America and North America. That is fascinating, sir. I'll, I'll, um, that you, uh, you know, that we have um, the kind of density of animals, wildlife that we have in the Himalayas. But that would be true also of India. Um, I mean, we have uh, so much more diversity in our wildlife than a lot of the other countries say, in the Western world. What you speak of the diversity of wildlife in the Himalayas would be true of the country of, course. Uh, of India. And, uh, and given that you've, you're an insider, you have played a key role in the contemporary wildlife conservation history from the birth of Project Tiger to... to Creation of the Wildlife Protection Act, and before as a erstwhile shikari as a as as a, a royal hunting of a hunt of a royal family, and to the so what would you what would you attribute as um, the fact that we have able, been able to preserve our wildlife as against say the Western world or you mentioned the Andes, but also other other regimes and countries. What do you think? India, why do you think India has done, been able to conserve its biodiversity, its wildlife? That's a very interesting question, Perna. And uh, one has, uh, I'm actually extremely proud of the fact that we have wonderful 
track record of conservation, India. Uh, the fact that despite the tremendous pressure on land, on <coughs> poverty, of poverty, of land hunger, of, uh, <coughs> of uh, um, if I may say so, illiteracy also, the, the country has not lost a single large mammal in historical times, extinct locally, except for one large mammal I'm talking about, birds, yes. Uh, not very many, but a few. Uh, the only animal that we lost, and that was in the last century, was the Asiatic cheetah. And that is why the eagerness to get it back, because the prodigal son is always dearer than somebody who is closer to home. But anyway, the, the, the cheetah, as I keep on saying, went extinct because we didn't know how to stop it. We didn't have the wherewithal to stop it. And it happened at the time when there was a turmoil of the war and turmoil of transition from British to Indian India. But now, unfortunately, and that is because for a number of reasons, vegetarianism, in India, a large majority is vegetarian. In Africa, everybody is a meat eater and everybody can be, and in some places is, a potential trapper and a, and a consumer of what is called, euphemistically, bushmeat. Uh, but it is not so in India. The other thing is our respect for life and our respect for the law. We are, a, by and large, a very law-abiding kind of a community. In, it is interesting that even, even uh, the Shikargas of princely India, after the independence, and I'm talking from Dachigam down to the others, uh, they were Shikargas, and they became parts. <laughs> even when independent India came about, and uh, these shikargas and these uh, reserves were regarded as relics of the past and feudalistic and whatever. There was a respect that they would not do any hunting and poaching. The private reserves which my father kept, and he had after independence no authority, were less poached in and less damaged by grazing and woodcutting and, and hunting than the others outside. But even out, outside, there was a respect. Look what happened in Africa. Total annihilation after the British left and the forceful yeah. look, look what happened mm -hmm. in and, and so many other countries. I don't want to name them. But it didn't happen in India. Sir. As I said, we had it made. We had right. an infrastructure. We had an empathy for life for nature and a respect for life, which we did not take advantage of. We lost in what I call the decade of the Holocaust, 47 to 57. What we lost in those 10 years was human. Then 70s onwards and 60s onwards, right, we, we thought differently. So, uh, later on. But the damage had been done in the first decade and a half, or a decade. And we lost the majority of them, including the tigers. The black buck population of, of Saurashtra, where I come from, decreased uh, in about seven, eight years from over 80,000 to less than 2,000 in just oh those 10 years. Yes. Um, it, that was the kind of, uh, and that is one species I mentioned. It, it happened across the board. So, and then, and then came an awakening, and and the rest is you know, um, is, is is documented. So, would you say that post seventies when it's documented? So, would you say its political will, its leadership, that that also has also besides the other factors that you mentioned? leadership, strong laws that has 
also contributed to conserving India's wildlife? Of course it is. I regard it as the primary. In, my, in the last chapter of my last book, I have uh, said what are the five or ten failings that we did. And I, as a personnel also, am responsible for those five or ten failings which we, have, we were not able to achieve uh, in the, from the 70s onwards. But, and then I have listed what are the five most important things that we should do. And number one, number one amongst all those is political risk. In India, unfortunately, uh, conservation comes from the top. And this is a paradox. It is an ironical fact that despite the base being so pro-conservation, so respectful of life, vegetarian. Uh, the, 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 there is no green movement from the ground swell. Um, yes, there are communities like there are others, but it has always come from the top. Princely India, British India, preservation for, for selfish reasons, for hunting. But it amounted to preservation. And after independence, from, from prime ministers who were interested. And when the prime minister got interested, his party chiefs in, and, the, and the chief ministers of the state got interested and gave, some of them were interested in any case. But when knew the boss was interested, they got enthused. And it percolated so you, down. So you give, uh, in your book that you mentioned, My Life with Wildlife, you richly illustrate it with the kind of political support that wildlife had in the 1970s. Can you give us an, an interesting story from that time to, you know, because uh, the times are different now and we'll come to that later. But uh, if, you know, something that you have, um, you can speak of the history of how wildlife enjoyed political support. Yes, um, it would not have been possible to have achieved in the field of wildlife of which I was a cog in the wheel um, without the support of the Prime Minister. And uh, Indira Gandhi in particular, Rajiv Gandhi partly, till he got embroiled in controversies, unfortunately. But he was also very interested. He was the, he was the only Prime Minister who was the Environment uh, Minister also. And I remember I was a a joint secretary uh, and uh, dealing with forest conservation and every hectare of forest land protected or reserved forest, protected forest even, one hectare of land or less even had to have the approval of the Prime Minister of India. The file used to go and he used to sign that yes, we will divest it. But I used to always put a caveat. If we have to, because it is essential for development, whatever, we will compensate this by so much to be added to the same part. If not possible, then somewhere else. And it was a quid pro quo. But things have changed. And um, so that was the personal interest. And every, every uh, winter, uh, Rajiv Gandhi used to go and spend it in some forest, which also showed that the person was genuinely interested. And when they knew that uh, the Prime Minister was interested, I think it gave a very strong message. Um, as far as Indira Gandhi was concerned, it, uh, the Wildlife Act, uh, though it, if I may boldly say so, was my idea and I mooted it to her in a meeting in September um, 1971. She took it on. It was a state subject. And when the meeting went, came on, Dr. Tarakan Singh was there, the IG Forest was there, and there were other very, very dedicated conservationists there. And they all said uh, that we need to do something about wildlife. But what, she said. And um, so I mooted this idea that uh, uh, we need a very strong legislation because whatever is there at that time 
was an offshoot or a little part of the Indian Forest Act of 1927, which was how to regulate hunting, how, what were the shooting blocks, how many animals could be hunted, the open season for hunting, game reserves, and uh, uh, how many animals could be shot, all that. that. It was just restricted to Maharashtra had a wildlife law. It was the only state, and that was entirely because of the influence of the Bombay Naturalist Society. There was an act. There was not even an act to set up national parks and sanctuaries. You know, Corbett was set up by a separate act. The, at that time, the Haley National Park in 1935, British era. And uh, Kana was set up uh, there. Kana was there already. But there were l less than half a dozen parks in the whole country. Right. There was nothing to set up a par park sanctuary. There was nothing to control trade and taxidermy in wildlife. And what about so, animals outside of uh, forest areas? The forest act didn't deal with them. So when I said that, uh, and I said we need an act, we need a uniform legislation which would control all these factors, which would not just control hunting, but uh, but taxidermy trade which is so, so harmful uh, and uh, so exacting, and also to set up parks and sanctuary. So she took up the idea, um, but it was a state subject at that time, under the constitution. And that is why it says wildlife, two separate subjects, two separate words. Uh, yeah. So when I mooted the idea, Dr. Karan Singh said that um, we, um, and I, I, I quoted the constitution, article two, um, 48. Um, I read with Article 250. Uh, I said, um, we, if the government of India gets approval of two states um, by a resolution passed in their state assemblies, then uh, the state center can legislate on any central subject. And it would apply to those states who initially empowered the government of India to do uh, this act and those who subsequently adopt the act. Dr. Karan Singh, and rightly so, said, which state will give us those powers? And Mrs. Gandhi turned to him and said, I will write to the chief ministers and ask them to give me those powers. And she wrote mm. a very, a very interesting letter. She had come back to power after um, a, a snap election that took place when she lost in the Raj Sabha the constitutional amendment to, to do with the privileges and the privy purses of the princely states. She had lost uh, in the Raj Sabha by a few votes. So she went to the polls and came back with a thumping majority and got that, uh, that constitutional amendment done. And she writes uh, that letter I read, read, I don't have a copy of it. He says, I am writing to you for, for the first time after my re-election on a non-political subject. Will you kindly give us those powers? And would you believe it? 18 states, 18, including one non-Congress rule state, oh, empowered the government of India to legislate on wildlife, which is a state subject, before I had finished my work of drafting the act. Oh my God. It took and me that four or five months, to... thanks to the tribal. That was the, uh, the kind of thing. Because she wrote it. Oh my God. And, that was it. Know, and all along, piloting the bill, giving it priority, when I went to the Law Commission, they said, yes, yes, we will do it for you, help you, but please come after four months because we are too busy just now. I sent a little note saying the Prime Minister wanted to do this in a hurry, but I'm told this. And the same Deputy Secretary phoned me two days later, will you come tomorrow? <laughs> So that's such an interesting story, sir. I will. I just need to ask you two more questions. We're running out of time. As I mentioned, uh, uh, one I will come to uh, political support now to wildlife. But before that, you have been you have created um, a number of national parks. You have contributed to their creation, extending protected areas, and this appears to be a controversy which says that we don't need protected areas because they are, there's fortress conservation, but, uh, uh, and creation of protected areas is very, very difficult now. As you rightly point out in your book, what we have managed to do is, is what we have managed to do. What are your thoughts on both? I mean, do, 
how critical are protected areas and do you think we have any scope for their expansion given given i mean do you feel there is a need for their expansion in whatever conservation reserve national park uh, protection uh, of the environment is a question of its priority i am very proud to be an indian i am very proud of the heritage of india and all that goes with it we we uh, have a wonderful um, archaeological historical cultural legacy and uh, it is the bounded duty of the government and every individual citizen of india to protect them. and we do protect them does not uh, the uh, the natural national heritage also count the national natural heritage of india is also unequal if that is not something sacrosanct if that is nothing it goes against our very culture it <clears throat> it goes against all those that was ancient uh, muni stone and they didn't teach us only about sanatan dharma and worship they also taught about sanctity of life about about the forest why did one do one prastha why did they all sit in the forest and there is a beautiful shlok in in the yajurved which said that the sacred ceremony of the janev must be accomplished by wood havan is an integral part of our ritual must be done by wood which is picked up dead and dry from the ground and not cut from the tree what does that indicate respect for trees respect for animate and inanimate life that is a part of our culture and if and that has to be protected now in a situation like india where people are very very important and people have to live and people have to exist we have to make a compromise we can't have wildlife and forest everywhere though we trying to uh, to grow trees in, in urban areas and we should but we have to have our forest areas as as biodiversity uh, repository as carbon sinks and we are talking about reduction of pollution and our oh. commitment to to uh, to uh, uh, the uh, the paris conference and whatever else now now <clears throat> it was evident to me more than 50 years ago that the kind of political the kind of uh, demographic pressure that will be there in the world we will be able to only save our nature forget animals and birds nature in national parks and country and that is why i made it a mission to have as many national parks and i have written something on it and i have called them as they published an article many years ago called our havens of hope and hope oh. is not just animals and birds as the survival of nature and where where we can have and and where people can go and and also have a, a communion with nature which is a so, part of our culture there is also therefore we are unique and this is what i would like to point out we are one of the very few constitution of the world which says that it is the fundamental duty of every citizen to protect forest and wildlife so if we are talking about fundamental rights there are no fundamental rights without fundamental duties so it is a fundamental duty of every citizen to protect forest and wildlife and it this constitution goes furthermore it goes on to say it in the directive principles that it shall be the duty of the government state and central all them to protect the forest and wildlife of the nation so when you are not abiding by they you breaking the constitution so i would like to do you think do you see your life's work whittling away what i mean you know the your and also what is it that like you, you what you would like to comment on the current situation do we have the political will to save wildlife 
it has been um, uh, lacking and progressively decreasing in the last 30 years. So it's not one political party, it's across the board. Uh, now, in, in, in diverse ways, one understands the need for development. Nobody can ever deny that, uh, that uh, uh, progress has to be made, that uh, uh, development has to take place. The situation is simply this, that in most cases, there are alternatives. We are not conservationists, are not um, Luddites. We are not diehard uh, that we will say that there should be no development and that forest and wildlife come before everything else. Far from it. But in most cases, uh, conservation is, as, as, the, as the administration, is the art of two possible. There are compromises that can be done. The, the will should be there. It means a little more expenditure, a little more give and take. We do not say don't build um, the uh, power line, don't build the, uh, the uh, pavan chakis, the windmills in, in the desert. We need power in and India this is the uh, alternate power. But do you have to build in the only surviving breeding areas of the great Indian bustard? It is now breeding in two places. Do we have to have them there? There is no such thing as a Lakshman Rekha or a Rubicon. Is there nothing sacred? And I will go, if we regard, if we have any, would you, would you drill if somebody told you that there is oil next to the Taj Mahal? Would you drill there? Would you, would you drill for diamonds in Ajanta in Elora? and blast the place up so that the whole thing can shake? No. Would, you, would you go and, and do something near some of our temples? Well, aren't Kaziranga and Kana and many other parks temples of nature? Are they not also our national heritage? Are they not also sacrosanct? Is there no such thing as a Rubicon or a Lakshman Rekha, that is, we only say this, we have said only, and you've been a part of the decision making, we have found alternatives. And if the political will is there, they will find alternatives. The PIL I filed against the, the government for the great Indian bastard is simply this. Please don't make it in the last surviving habitats of this very endangered species whose numbers are less than 100, and which happens to be the state bird of Rajasthan and which almost became the National Bird of India, had I had my well way. But anyway, um, so that is the kind of thing. If, if the motto, and I say this with some emphasis and some sorrow, if the motto is that we satisfy, and uh, what I'm using Mahatma Gandhi's words, if we are going to satisfy the need and the greed, of every individual and of every corporate house of this world, of this country. And we save what remains there afterwards. We might as well wind up the Ministry of Environment. Why, why have a facade? Say so, hum bachega wo bachayenge. Everything else is not important or of or tertiary importance. We will save what we can after doing satisfying the uh, everything. Then, then the picture is clear. But, the, the, but if we cannot be said, and God bless the tiger, that just we have increased the number of tigers and there is doubts and, 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 uh, and, uh, and controversies there. Just we have increased the number of tigers. I think we have saved the national natural heritage of India. We saved the forest. The whole thing of the tiger project was to save. But the tiger doesn't live everywhere of this country. It doesn't live in the Himalayas. The snow leopard does. Have we saved the habitat of the snow leopard? What is the point? You see, this is the perspective you should have. 
and the tiger is a flagship species of certain areas. The, the, the bustard is a flagship of the grasslands and we need grasslands more than any other country in the world because we have more livestock. We have a forest policy. We don't have a grassland policy. It's a free grazing for all and everyone. And in nature and in ecology, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And we should know that. This is the, the, the kind of uh, 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 emphasis and priority. So, at least the parks and sanctuaries should be such a thing. And you raise the point uh, the, the, uh, of, uh, of being uh, unhappy or being angry uh, and frustrated. Yes, it has been uh, a life journey. It has been also a, uh, a mission. And it has been a very rewarding mission, if I may say so. Um, and to see that, but I will go there. What about the, the, the millions of others who are also of that? And, and I will add this. And we are very proud of this in the nation, which is proud of the heritage of Gautam Buddha, of Mahavir, and of Mahatma Gandhi. What did Mahatma Gandhi say? Of, and this is something I've tried to keep in the back of my mind. I hope I've succeeded as a collector, commissioner, or whatever else in government. That when you take a decision, please think how it will affect the poorest of the poor. In that context, in this country of Mahavir and Gautam Buddha and Mahatma Gandhi, the animals and birds of India are also citizens of India. And the, the court has even recognized an elephant, but elephant is not the only living being, as a person, an individual entity. So these poor citizens also are, are citizens of India. They have a right. And yeah. they are your heritage. They are part of the Indian milieu. If you regard them as that, have you taken decisions which regard the poorest of the poor? Just because they don't have a vote, it doesn't mean they are not citizens of India. It's such a um, profound thought and I do hope that these words will be taken to heart and uh, by the government because they are indeed the poorest of the poor our wildlife is. It has no voice, it has no vote. And these uh, every decision must be keeping them in mind. And uh, thank you so thank much, you. sir. Such a privilege. Such a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much.